Hello and welcome to the podcast, Every Moment is Sacred, where we interweave meditation and healing into everyday life. I am your host, Rain Elizabeth Stickney. Now, let us begin. Do you believe in a world of possibilities? Sarah Cross does. She is a master storyteller. She lives in New Zealand. She has traveled all around the world. She has a wonderful podcast called Stories That Wow. You can find that podcast on any podcasting platform, specifically Apple and Spotify. Two of my favorite episodes on Sarah's podcast are the one titled My Story and also the interview with Catherine Switzer, who was the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. Sarah is filled to the brim and overflowing abundantly with insightful stories. Some of these stories she tells to her family. She has children and a husband. Some of these stories she hears and she picks up along the way. Some are from various countries and some stories she seeks out to support her writing projects like speaking with elders, specifically people in their 90s, listening to their stories of their lives and hearing their wisdom and what everything looks like from their vantage point. Sarah is a second-time international best-selling author. Her books are Ignite Happiness and Ignite Your Wisdom. I will link to all of Sarah's information in the show notes. You can find her on social media. Her name is spelled with an H, Sarah with an H at the end, Cross, C-R-O-S-S. Sarah is a lover of life. She is a storytelling coach. Look up her program, The Art of Storytelling. She has so much to share. I'm happy to share with you this conversation that she and I had together, and you will hear a little bit about her own healing journey with eczema and also many, many, many healing moments with stories and gratitude in general. You might notice how the sound is as I'm speaking to you right now, my beloved audience all of you dear listeners, my mic is fixed. (laughs) If you listen to this show, Every Moment is Sacred, you might have heard some episodes with some funky sound or me mentioning that my mic broke at some point, and it did, and it is fixed. So we are back in show business here. And to celebrate voices, my voice, Sarah's voice, voices from around the world, all of us finding our true voice, I invite you to listen to all of the episodes of my podcast that call your name. This is number 23, so you have plenty to choose from now. If you haven't already shared with a friend, rated, reviewed, subscribed, so you get to hear the newest episodes first, please do so. That helps spread the word that every moment truly is sacred in this life, just the way it is in this world, just the way it is. And healing and meditation, and specifically the healing power of meditation all belong in our daily life if we choose to turn toward them. 
if we choose to embody and look for and practice the healing, if we choose to breathe into meditation and see what it has to teach us. All of this is available every day and in celebration of voices that heal and voices that share meditation. Please support this show. Another way you can support the show is you can visit me on Patreon, patreon.com slash rain Elizabeth, and you can support the show there as well. Thank you so much for being here. I am delighted to present to you Sarah Cross, master storyteller in this episode that I like to call the gift of stories with Sarah Cross. Hey, Sarah. Hi there. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. I'm so delighted that you are a storyteller and that I get to speak face to face with a storyteller. (laughs) Thank you so much because I love stories so much and it's something that I'm very passionate about. And I think we all need more stories in our lives. We need to tell more. We need to listen to more. And so it's lovely to be here. Do you have a favorite story? Oh, that is such a great question. I have stories that I have heard from other people that have really shifted the way I think by just hearing one story. And so I personally know that stories can be immensely powerful. One of my favorite stories was actually when I watched a TED talk and it is by a guy called Eddie Jeku, who wrote a book called The Happiest Man on Earth. And he did that at the age of 100. And even if he didn't know his story, knowing that alone made me reassess what we think age means and what's possible. And the excuse that we're too old to do something is literally an excuse because we can still do so much at whatever age. But his book and his story started during the time of the Holocaust because he's from Germany and he went through so much trauma during that experience. And your heart obviously just goes out to people that really went through so much, both mentally, physically, spiritually, in every dimension. And coming out the other side, that he was not happy, Mm. um, which is something you would totally understand. But it was in the moment where he was looking down at his firstborn son, that he suddenly realized if he carried on the way he was, he was going to pass down all this pain to his Mm. son. And that carrying around this pain was literally hurting himself. And that we may hurt our enemies, but in the process, we're actually hurting ourselves more the image of holding on to that hot burning coal that we don't realize. And this is what hatred can do to ourselves because it destroys us in the process. And this was his message. And he decided to become the happiest man on earth and the kindest and the most giving and his, his life transformed and watching him give a talk at the age of 99 with this huge smile on his face of how happy he was for everything that he had in his life and his family. And when I heard his story of firstly what he'd been through, but what he'd been able to let go, it really made me realize of how much we all hold on to and then how much we're actually transmitting out to the people around us. And Mm -hmm. by him showing what was possible because the trauma he went through was one of the most extremes anyone on earth has gone through. And so for him to show and lead the way, it almost gave me permission to say, it's okay to let go of anything. You know, mm-hmm. if I can do it, you can do it. And I believe this is what stories can do. They're so powerful that just by listening to somebody else's story of what they've been able to process themselves can inspire you to radically change your life as well. Mm-hmm. 
I am radically changed already from this story. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. It is a very powerful story. And I do believe there's many out there. And because I think I have now started paying attention to these stories, I notice that there are some people also that are phenomenal storytellers mm -hmm. and that great speakers are also amazing people to communicate. And this art of storytelling is something that really draws us in because from a young age, we listen to stories perhaps from our parents or we read books and they're all stories. Mm -hmm. They're all words that magnify our imagination. Mm -hmm. And I love what this does, lead us into possibilities. There are just so many incredible stories out there. There really are. And I believe that it actually starts with paying attention and listening in and asking those questions. Because mm -hmm. in this process, I realized that even those closest to us, often we may not know some incredible stories of those around us because we're running around and we're focused on today and tomorrow and our huge to-do list. But I don't think there's anyone that doesn't have an incredible story within them that wouldn't just make you sit down and be transformed like the most amazing next. Netflix film where you just are riveted <laughs> to your seat and you don't want to move and I just don't think we're sharing enough of those transformational amazing incredible connecting stories mm -hmm. well thank you for being such a strong voice in the world of storytelling both through your writing and also through your podcast and I imagine you must also tell stories, like maybe in your family, you're a mom. So maybe there are many, many, many ways that you're sharing stories with the world. Yes, absolutely. And what I've realized is that it works really well with children. I have young children and when there are, and stories can be funny as well, they can be entertaining. Or I've noticed that when my children, and it happened just this Christmas that something uh, my daughter had all these little tiny beads that she was piecing together and suddenly she accidentally knocked them all <laughs> over and they went everywhere and she just like you know the face goes first and then the whole sour <laughs> face and then she just started crying and that was the moment I suddenly interestingly enough remembered something that got broken when I was a child on Christmas day it was one of my favorite gifts and it got broken and so rather than me go there and just go oh these things happen we can pick them up I told her a story of I know just what it was like and oh, this whole Christmas day of how my and I think for a moment she forgot what had happened to her and then she listened into my story and then started asking questions to me about when I broke this little toy and what was it? And did you get another one and, and everything? And it just totally diffused the whole situation. And so I think they're great for connection with our families as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I hear, I hear a transformational moment in the shared experience that blossomed between you and your daughter. So not only did she have this experience of beads everywhere, you're sharing that experience with her, but then your life becomes part of the story. And so the connection grows across time, across space. And then I imagine you and she in the world of of timeless storytelling. I think that's beautiful the way you've just put that because exactly we inherited stories from previous generations and we pass them down. And I think at the end of the day, that is the legacy that we leave. It's mm -hmm. the stories that other people will tell of us and also the stories that we told of ourselves that other people will repeat. And so stories really are intergenerational and legacies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
there is a family member in my family who is one of my elders and she's a wonderful storyteller and she tells stories about the family. She tells stories about the earth and she tells stories about just really anything. And when I was a teenager, I decided that I would know I'm successful in my life when I become a really good storyteller because I felt so inspired by her. So I'm still working at it. (laughs) Yes. And I think that that is something like you just said, listening to other people that I actually never believed I was good at stories. And I, so maybe they often say that we work on things that we ourselves want to improve Mm -hmm. because I would hear people who were very good at jokes and could remember the endings and jokes in a way can often be short stories. And I found myself always thinking, I wish I could be like those people who were captivating because one of the things about jokes is that they captivate people and then they entertain them. And so like you, I always looked up to people who were very good at that. And I think this is now why I really enjoy working on it because I believe it's also a skill set that you can mold and improve and get better at. And so we can all take a little bit of a further step towards those people that inspired us in our childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel inspired by you as well. And (laughs) I find that for me, stories can be healing. Do you have any good healing stories in your life or just any healing that's present for you today? One of the biggest things that has been for me in this past year is that over time I have had huge transformation with my skin and particularly my hands because I grew up with eczema and it was in different parts of my body. And then later in life as an adult, it went more to my hands, which meant that everything that I touched and you don't really realize until you have an issue with something that is so practical because you touch so many thousands of things all the time and anything that basically contained a liquid of some description would tend to dry my hand and to the point where it was very hard to move it very painful but at the same time I also was so used to it that I would just move through it But it's been this year, this last year rather, that I thought, what if, what if I am able to be active in being a part of this healing? And that rather than thinking this is something that I'm stuck with, that to shift that story and say, what can I do? And so I did so many things across the board and I can't be sure of course that any one of them was the reason but I do believe that investing in your health is one of the best things that you can ever do and so my key was not actually to heal my hand my key was to make my immune system as strong as it could be and I think it was probably triggered by COVID as well and thinking I don't want to get ill and I've always had this these words actually that although my skin was bad I would say I never get ill So I think these stories we tell ourselves are so powerful because when you look to the science behind that, the positivity and the boost and the energy, um, they've proven time after time as well. And I know people who work in in cancer areas that those with a positive mindset always heal much faster, much quicker, have a better rate of recovery. Mm -hmm. The way that we think really impacts our body physically. And so we all know that if we're depressed or down, then that has a physical reaction. But I started looking to the other side, like if the negative has a negative effect, the positive can have a positive effect. So what if I truly believe that my skin will get better? What if I creatively visualize it being 100% better? And then what if I back that up with making sure that I have the healthiest diet possible, which I went on a kind of probably two month detox of getting rid of a lot. And I I consider myself to be quite a healthy eater, but I took lots of, I read a lot. So I took lots of little things like from Dan Buechner 
in his blue zones, which are areas in the world where people live, there's a large amount of people, centenarians over the age of 100. And one of the things they have is they eat a lot less meat. They might eat meat like once a month. So I thought, you know, what if I take that idea and I eat a little bit less meat and everywhere you eat, pretty much everyone says green leafy vegetables, green vegetables are the big healers. So what if I add more of those into my diet and I still have the water and I exercise pretty much every day because exercise as well, when you listen to that, not only gives you those boosts of the chemicals, but actually is known to heal. So what if I do as much as I physically can, and then the extra nutrients that may be missing from my diet because I don't eat dairy. So I looked and then I discovered along this way, there are all these things that we presume a lot of our food is packed with certain nutrients, and yet the nutrients of course come from the soils. And so if the soils aren't very good because we are as a, as a planet not investing enough in the quality of our soils. And so I found that there's lots of nutrients that ironically later I discovered people with skin problems often suffer from certain nutrient deficiency. And so I mm-hmm. added those into my diet and all these different and then um, working on your positive mindset. And so all these little things that I did came to the point where I suddenly in the last couple of months almost just realized that my skin's good but this time it just feels different it Mm -hmm. feels like it's healed because before every time I would literally touch water wash my hands and unfortunately with COVID and having to put all those pumps and things we just destroyed my my hands because they've got quite strong things in them Um, Mm -hmm. And so to the point now where I feel allowed my body to heal itself and I just gave it the boost it needed to be able to get back to where it wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing story of healing. I love all the work that you did and I get a feeling of joy as you're talking about it, like as though you're a computer of healing but I get a joyful feeling (laughs) from your description. Thank you. And that's one of the things now is that I am so grateful for it. And every single day, I literally look down, probably several times a day, I look down at my hands and my skin and I go, oh my goodness, my skin is so incredible. I'm so grateful for it every single day, which I wasn't always able to say because we use our hands so much. And what it also made me realize is that there's so many aspects, like I have to admit, I'm not as grateful for my arms or my legs or different aspects of my body. And we tend to just take things for granted. And so I love the fact that I can totally appreciate that and be grateful for it. And I think it's only if you haven't had something that you acutely realize how wonderful it is when something works in the way that you want it to. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the gratitude is part of the healing process for you? Or was the gratitude like a reward as your hands healed? I think I have always been quite grateful for a lot of other aspects in my life. Um, I very much appreciate I've traveled and seen people that have lived in all different circumstances and had or not the same opportunities that I have. So I have a general gratitude for everything, but I do feel specifically for my hands. It was only after that they were so wonderful again that I really felt this deeper sense of gratitude specifically for my Mm. skin, which I hadn't probably felt as much I tried to do it when my skin wasn't so good but there's that little voice in your head when you're going I'm so grateful for the healing of my skin and then that little voice at the back going but look at them they're hardly healed are they really (laughs) (laughs) but when they are you can embody it and go oh yes whereas Mm -hmm. I think I wasn't at that level before Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love the honesty of your answer (laughs) 
So I'm wondering if somebody wanted to change something about their life, somebody wanted to change their way of being in the world or an aspect of their health, or just somebody says, ah, this, I want to change. How might they go about it through story or the wisdom of words or the kinds of things you like to embody in your life? I love that question. And instinctively, I think the first thing is believing that that change is possible. If you truly don't believe it's possible, then I don't think anything that you'll do is going to shift things. But you only need a like 0.001%, just the tiniest possibility of belief that I think this could work. And and if you, what I, I actually love reading about bizarre miracles all around the world or things out of the box that people can't explain because it actually actually allows you to believe in something bigger than yourself that we don't have to have the answers for everything we don't have to know how or why something happens sometimes just that it is possible and so to me that is the first step that if you can believe something is possible it opens doors and then for me researching about other people's stories and what i first when i got into storytelling i love also telling other people's stories because there's incredible people all around the world. And if you read their stories of transformation, it actually opens the door a little bit more to say, look, this happened to this person. So maybe it could happen to me too, or whatever you want in terms of creating a new lifestyle, starting a business, traveling more. The more that we listen to and read other people's stories, we realize that that could be us too. And so Mm -hmm. then I think you just start on that yellow brick road of research and belief, and then things start to tumble perhaps into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that all happening along the yellow brick road. (laughs) Mm. Yes. And I I think that I was actually watching the Wizard of Oz recently and my girls were actually in a a play for it. And I think it's such a great story in itself because that, I mean, uh, if you ignore the fact that it was a dream, but (laughs) that (laughs) reality also throws things in us that might not be the way we imagine. Um, when they had, and I can't remember the name of, when they get to Oz and the great wizard doesn't turn out to be the person that they thought. You know, this Mm -hmm. was the guy who was going to do everything. And actually it turns out that they've done it for themselves. And so that story in itself has come back to, they thought they needed someone outside themselves to show them the way to do it all for them and to tell them what to do. And I do think many of us think that and even myself often. But what I have shown even with my hands is that we are so much more and need to be so much more of an active role in our own story of healing or whatever we want to focus on. And that even if we can't see it, that's where the the true transformation lies and the work that we do on ourselves. I love that story of the Wizard of Oz and the way that you retell it is so beautiful. And I like that you mentioned that it was all a dream and it reminds me of how that story is so filled with seeing through illusion. So the illusion of the wizard being a wizard and actually it's just a man and isn't life that way where we get to see through illusion again and again and again? Yes. And that also brings me back to the work of Byron Katie, who her idea is to challenge everything and ask, is it true? Is it absolutely true that so much that we attach ourselves to or we presume might be stories that are actually made up by our culture? And we think things that are so set in stone, that things that we have to do or that we should 
are actually just ideas that we can challenge. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you said it's like an illusion and that even with my children, I tell them all the time, you know, one of them is wearing orange glasses and one of them is wearing blue glasses and they're just looking at the world through a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And that what if we sometimes swap those glasses and see things or try to see things from other people's point of view that we suddenly realize our own perspective was just an illusion that was only available to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lovely example. I can see so much healing happening through just literally putting on a different set of glasses for a moment. (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. And I, I, I think that it's also easy to say, and when you're in those moments sometimes and someone that you're, coming up against and particularly it can be people closest to you you know my husband and I don't always agree on Mm -hmm. certain things but in those moments to shift and say why is he saying this why does he think this why do I completely think the opposite and we're both talking about the same thing Mm -hmm. and so how is this possible in those moments that's when we actually need those glasses more than ever but sometimes they're also just (laughs) out of reach but I think the more we practice seeing you know and asking ourselves those questions why does this person think this way Mm -hmm. what is it that I'm not seeing right now or not understanding that is pushing us away from seeing things from this a similar perspective Mm -hmm. I noticed that a couple of times in this conversation, you've used the word possibility or possibilities. And I'm thinking about how a person needs to be open to new possibilities in order to have the courage to put on somebody else's glasses or see from somebody else's eyes. And that place of unknown In my work with individuals and couples and people who are exploring meditation, that place of unknown can be quite scary for some and understandably so because it's unknown, yet it's also filled with possibility. Do you know what I'm describing? Yes, absolutely. And it almost feels as well the excitement, I think, the aura wonder that kids have of the not knowing. They love that newness and excitement and yet I think as adults we get so fearful of something that's unfamiliar and we get so ingrained and I used to see like so many people on a conveyor belt and just stepping off that like you describe can be so huge that thinking this is the way and the more that I have traveled the more that I've realized that there is no way there is no particular thing and we're all doing our own little dance as we go through life but you're right that possibility is such a big word for me and it is my word of what I want to bring through my podcast which Mm -hmm. is about inspiring stories and that's really why I started it because I want people to believe in possibilities for themselves Mm -hmm. and Like I said before, it doesn't have to be that you know all the answers or know the direction or know everything. It just has to be that start of a belief. But like you say, that's that's not always easy if you've been ingrained in certain cultural or environmental beliefs that are very hard to step out of. Mm, Good point. Good point. And your show, your podcast is called Stories That Wow. Is that right? Yeah. So tell us a bit about where you've been. I remember you saying that you were born in the UK and you're living in New Zealand now. And I've heard some of your stories about some of your travels. And and tell us a little bit about what have you seen in the world? Where have you been? I have been very grateful to have traveled lots of places but I think the more you travel the more you realize how much bigger the world is than what you can ever see and so really I have spent a lot of time around the Mediterranean and I love the all the different cultures there the different 
languages and one of the things I used to love the most were the different food markets in these different cities and towns because it's the hustle and bustle of the real authentic daily life that people are living and you get to see what people grow and interact and I absolutely love markets I believe they're a real insight into a country we also spent a couple of years in Southeast Asia and were there during the 2004 Indonesian tsunami which was a whole Mm. adventure unto itself and then a couple of years in the states mainly on the east coast and also um, Central America Panama Um, so a few places but I also feel like that's so small in in consideration with how big the world Mm -hmm. is but Mm -hmm. I love seeing different people from different cultures because I believe we all have so much to give to each other and learn from each other that we then see that we can take on different ideas and that we don't have to accept the ones that were given to us when we were brought up but oh look at the way this is being done and I think that awe and majesty to recognizing and that's I think what is so amazing when you go to new places is the fact that everything's new and different and I think when we live in the same town and same city for our whole lives everything around us becomes very familiar which is why I think stepping out of that is very hard whereas when we see how different things are and we get so absorbed in the moment in different countries we have that sense of wow or oh look at this this is so different and it's so enticing and so wonderful that we realize we are just a world of differences but there's Mm -hmm. so much beauty in that as well Mm -hmm. absolutely I love that phrase a world of differences I feel the holding of unity and yet the honoring of all of the very, very special points of light, as though no point of light is the same, yet we're all in it together. Absolutely. And I think like flowers, that there are so many varieties of flowers, there's so many different colors, there's so much beauty. And actually often when you see fields um, that are full of all different types of flowers, different sizes, different heights, it actually enhances the field and Mm. so I think that's the same with us as people we are enhanced by being exposed to different cultures and different people and different ways of thinking have you heard many stories from different cultures and different countries I have and I'm thinking that (laughs) right now there's not one that specifically springs to mind. But what I am reminded of, and when we were in Malaysia, and it was the first time that I'd been exposed to Muslims physically being in a different country and not through the news. And when I got there, I was like, oh, my goodness, these people are so similar to us. (laughs) I had discussions with people that the fact that um, we're all maybe um, Christian or different religions are all based around the same theme of love. Mm -hmm. And yet we make these barriers and separations. And yet there's far more that joins us together than that separates us. And so what I realized was the more that I talked to people from all over the world, the more actually our stories were the same, the stories of Mm. daily struggles in our lives or of trying to aspire to jobs or different things, different cultures, you know, because there's so many wealthier nations than other nations. And one of the things that I noticed, though, driving through or going through areas of immense poverty is that that wasn't reflected in the people you know we often assume that people who have so little are in total despair and I'm not to say that isn't poverty hugely impacts lives and it's something that is a huge world issue Mm -hmm. but I also saw people in Thailand and in Malaysia and places that to me from the outside looked like they didn't have much but they looked so happy 
And I've since read, I watched this film and they'd measured levels, I think, through questionnaires and processes. And they'd found that the average American on a scale was just as happy as a guy in India who pulled a little rickshaw, basically a taxi, Mm -hmm. a self-pulling taxi on wheels that took other people out. And this was a guy who lived in what I would describe as almost a a shack with just basic covers, not a permanent fixture of a house. He'd have to pull people around in all types of weathers. Mm -hmm. But then talking about his life was like, oh, but I love when I get home and my son comes running up to me and I, and all the positives that he could pull out. And when you think of the immense difference financially and what some people have in America with what a guy in India could have, and yet they could be classified on a par in terms of happiness. <laughs> it is so interesting. Amazing. I love all the stories that are coming through you today. I just, I get so many different visceral reactions. My body is responding to all the stories that you're telling with heat and warmth and tingles and imaginations. So I really appreciate your ability to just share and tell stories so easily is it easy for you I think it's something that I didn't think was easy for me what I have started to do is really tune in and focus but I also realize there's so many aspects to our life that we sometimes undervalue and I think having traveled a lot in being in different countries and had say more adventures Uh, I know that you might have in one of my books I talk about a trip we did with our children um, across the English Channel and because I have these events that have happened in my life that are maybe different from other people I haven't realized that I've been telling these stories for a long time because people will say oh how was it here and then you know you've got the story of when we were in Greece or Um, different stories on boats or all over the world and that through my choice to travel I actually have been collecting like an almost invisible cape with all these little pockets in of stories that I didn't realize I was collecting and I didn't Mm -hmm. realize were actually micro stories that I could tell and pass on about the beautiful interactions I've had with people from all over the world and the events that have come out of them and what I've learned. And so I think I was subconsciously doing this, which is now when I've come to consciously craft these, it's actually been easier than what I thought because I didn't realize I'd been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. What is the first story you ever told? That is a really great question. The first story I remember writing as a child, and this is what also is so interesting when you look back, is that when I was about 10 years old, I was given the task of writing a mini book and start, middle and end. But I think it was the first task we were ever given at school to write something where it could be prospectively for other people. Normally you just write, I think, or I did a lot, you're writing either about something like birds or trees or how they work, or you're writing about what you did last weekend. And when I wrote the story, I was like, oh, this is so enticing. I loved the idea of writing something for somebody else. And I think it kick-started that idea of, firstly, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could write a book or be an author one day? And also the fact that stories can be for other people. And so Mm -hmm. that's one of the early memories I have of really loving the idea of a story for me could be for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And what a great gift to share a story. If somebody came to you like me, who is esteems to be a storyteller one day, what are some tips or tricks about storytelling that you know? I think what really boosted 
my confidence was when I had to write the story for my first book in Ignite Happiness. And it was about this trip we did with our family. And I think there's something special about when you write a story down is that you collect the words together. And so then to retell it in a purposeful way became much easier for me. And so if I think there's a particular part of people's lives that they know would benefit other people, there's something quite magical in just writing things down because it allows you to notice what words you're using because Mm -hmm. words are very powerful. And also what you will then do is you will bring the story to a nice ending. And this is something that I realise like I mentioned earlier with the jokes that I wasn't very good at. And so when you write a story, you often will bring it to a a purposeful ending or a punchline or some takeaway. But I didn't do that when I was telling a story, I don't think. And so what it has really helped me to do is before I even start a story, think, how do I want this story to end? What is the takeaway for the other person? What is the message I want to pass on? And so that's something that I think when I started to realize that, it started to give me more confidence because I knew the direction of my story. I knew where Mm -hmm. it was going to end up. And so that to me, I think we can just start telling stories ourselves Mm -hmm. more so listening listening is so key because you hear other people's stories but then also and and that's probably one of my biggest also messages is to just pass on the stories that you love of other people or in books or things like that Mm -hmm. if you're not at a place that you want to tell stories that are maybe deep or authentic to you start with other people's and then just really tune into thinking about the ending and how you want to tie it all together. Mm, Beautiful. I'm thinking about the magic of stories and how there are paradoxes where we were talking about illusion earlier. And if I am to step into a story, I am both going into an unknown realm with myriad possibilities And yet sometimes I do know the ending, whether I'm telling the story or if it is a a known story like The Wizard of Oz. And do you know about that magic that storytelling can lead us into where whether the story is known or unknown, there is this magic of possibility where anything can happen. Anything can happen. Like it, it opens up a realm of the unordinary does this speak to you i think when we are children there's all stories have a much deeper sense of inviting us into imagination Mm -hmm. and i love stories that help us to dream bigger and think beyond ourselves and relate to them in so many different ways and I heard it recently said and I absolutely love the idea of making your life the story you want to tell in hindsight Mm. in that the best story is the story of our own lives and what we choose to do with it and then how are we going to tell that story back to ourselves one day and any story like you say we all have different glasses on. So if we all talked about a birthday party that happened that we all attended, we would all tell it in a completely different way. You know, someone who loves chocolate might talk about how amazing the cake was. Someone who likes games would talk about how much fun the games were. And so we're all telling our story from our own perspective, our own viewpoint. And I think there's a lot of value in adding the different dimensions and looking from the broader picture. But yes, I think the biggest story is the story 
of our lives and what can we do with that on a daily basis and what are we telling ourselves on a daily basis of the story of who we are is the most powerful one we can possibly create excellent point I love imagining into that and I love that you brought in the word imagination Sometimes I talk to my 80-year-old self, which the older I get doesn't seem that far away anymore. (laughs) And I wonder what she sees from her perspective of my life or our life or her life. Yeah, just imagining the life story brought me to that 80-year-old self, the conversation that I ask her advice or her perspective sometimes. Yes. And I, I say exactly the same thing, but I say my 90 year old self. Yeah. <laughs> and I ask that question sometimes, what would my 90 year old, that can be to the positive or negative sometimes because my 90 year old self is more carefree. Oh, <laughs> more, you know, as more, you should just go for it. You should just do it. Mm. My 90 year old self says that a lot more. Whereas my self now brings in more of the drama of the day oh but we can't do that because we've got to think about the a b c and d you Mm -hmm, know mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so but my 90 year old self is just like throwing those to the wind (laughs) and she's much more adventurous which comes back and interestingly enough this is such a passion I'm actually part way through writing the book and I haven't got the official title but it's basically what would your 90 year old self tell you and I was interviewing have been interviewing people in their 90s because I thought I wonder if people in their 90s will say what they I think they'll say like my 90 year old self you know will they give the same advice and it's been an incredible learning opportunity to listen to people and the wisdom that they have at that age and what they would say to themselves what they say to other people what's important to them And through this journey as well, it kick-started my whole, oh my goodness, look at all these incredible stories we all hold within Mm. that often people don't hear as much. And so it's also one of those things that, that I think ultimately led to pushing me towards the podcast and the stories and all these little things that you don't realize are pushing you in a certain direction of the power of stories and also the power of listening to each other more. Hmm. I feel so happy that you're writing this book and also listening to all these amazing people with their real life journeys to share. What yes, wealth. Absolutely. So we've talked a little bit about gratitude and healing, lots about stories and possibilities. I'm going to ask you a surprise question. Is that okay? Sure. If you were a character in a story right now, what character would you be? Ooh, that is a great story. I, a great idea of the story <laughs> concept because I was thinking this year, I the word I've chosen for this year is wild, which I chose it because I've decided to not instinctively overthink things as much as I have done in the past and that if you feel pulled to a particular word when I looked at a whole list this is the one that you know seemed to stick out a little bit and maybe it's because we're also going to be doing some traveling this year we're going back to the UK and we've got some ideas that involve boats and water and we're not got those specifically lined up Um, but at the same time me wanting to expand my business and I think as um, as women we can often come up against a lot more overthinking than perhaps men do but I was thinking recently of if I was to draw a little character and I, I was actually looking up the words because I don't know the words that maybe someone who is if you're going through a jungle and you imagine like a little uh, a little girl, but those swords where they kind of bend round that if you're going to go walk through a jungle, mm-hmm. how you have to slash everything to clear the way and have that and be a little bit of a like warrior, an adventurer, a let's 
seize life because I truly believe that we just don't know what's around the corner. And so I don't know the name of this character, but right <laughs> now that's where I feel like, let's go, let's seize the day. Let's, you know, walk through this forest that's got so many things, but it's okay because I've got this huge knife and I can carve my own way to wherever we need to get to. Oh. Wild storytelling. <laughs> I love this character. I can see her. I want to know everything about her and exactly where she's going and what she experiences. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your words of wisdom. And is there anything else you would like to say to the world or the future storytellers or the brilliant storytellers that are out there already sharing their words of wisdom? I think what has come up today is my biggest hope is that everybody believes that if they have a dream of whatever they look forward to that, like we've reiterated, that there's a possibility out there for them of something and it's often not as hard as what you make up in your head that it's going to be and that every day is this beautiful gift really I think that is we don't often appreciate at the time but I know that looking back our 90 or 80 year old selves will definitely recognize more than I think we do in the moment and so thank you very much for this honor today of speaking with you and I look forward to the future and seeing where we're going and if people want to be inspired then tune in to my podcast stories that wow or reach out and connect with me because I also believe that we are all phenomenal storytellers in the making that we are all able to master storytelling and get better at it and then bring us in because the art of communication and the way we interact with people is so key to everything that we do and so whether you are talking to your children or you're talking to your husband or at work because marketing is also storytelling and so I think this is one of the most beneficial things that you can invest in you is to become a more confident happier storyteller I feel it <laughs> I feel inspired by you Sarah thank you so much Thank you so much for listening. It has been a great joy to have your presence here in this podcast. I welcome you to celebrate the joy and wisdom in your life exactly as it is. And I welcome you to feel loved, fully loved, exactly as you are. www dot rain elizabeth dot org